Hi guys, and welcome to yet another video in the HSC Chemistry Series. This is Chemical Monitoring and Management video number 11, and it's really the wrap up of the third section of Monitoring and Management, in which we just have a little bit of a chat about monitoring ions. And we've looked so far at the way we identify different ions in solution, cations and anions, and whether we do that through precipitation reactions or flame tests either at a qualitative or quantitative level is going to be dependent on the um, level of each of those ions and the substances we're looking at. And when we're testing certain substances, um, waters and soils, um, some of the elements are in such small quantities that we need a different testing and then we've used AAS for that. So when we're looking at essential trace elements, it's AAS that comes into play for us to try and identify those. We've also looked in the last video at the fact that AAS has actually given us a lot of information about certain types of um, elements that are needed by different organisms, living organisms, in order for them to survive. But we haven't had methods up until um, this one that allowed us to measure concentrations that were so low that we could still actually identify certain things that were present. What we now know is that quite a large number of different ions um, are important for, and in fact in some cases are vital for the survival of different types of living organisms. I've put some examples down here for you to have a look at, things like copper, which is involved in the production of enzymes, um, iron, which is an important component of blood haemoglobin, uh, cobalt, which is part of the um, construction of vitamin B12, um, chromium, which is part of, uh, I guess, fat um, carbohydrate metabolism and also has a link to the function of insulin and how that maintains uh, sugar levels in the blood. Zinc is important for amino acid metabolism and energy and has also been linked to immune function, particularly the third line of defense. Uh, manganese, which is about, um, which plays a role in the clotting of blood. Um, iodine, which is specifically linked to thyroid function, and we've looked at iodine in terms of um, a radioactive isotope of iodine, which can be used to track um, any problems with the thyroid. And even things like hydrogen, which we know the presence of hydrogen can change the pH of uh, our waterways, and pH is very, very important for the functioning of enzymes in living organisms. So there's lots of different ions that we can monitor in solution and a lot of different ways in which we can um, identify the concentration of those ions. Though when they are in very small concentrations, that's when we need some very precise techniques such as AAS has given us. Now as well as very small quantities of ions being important for survival of organisms, there are also very small quantities that can be uh, considerably toxic to organisms as well. And one of the best examples of these, I guess, is lead. Lead was very commonly used um, until 20, 30 years ago when its um, role as a cumulative poison that was actually linked as a carcinogen um, was known to be uh, a major problem. I guess the, the uh, greater problem with lead too, or the one that's actually um, being noted more recently is the um, effect that it has on brain function and uh, neurological disorders and also just even in intellectual development in children if they are exposed to um, high quantities of lead when they're growing up. So if they're just playing in the backyard and that soil is, is contaminated with lead can affect their growth and development. The problem that we have is that leads, um, lead was so used in such a widespread way that there is a lot of lead still in the environment. So any old petrol stores, leaded petrol was very popular and um, it was used to enhance as a fuel enhancer, so it uh, allowed the octane to burn more um, uh, efficiently and also used as a valve lubricant. We now know the use of lead is a big problem and so um, Australia has banned the use of leaded petrol, so then you find unleaded everywhere, except for, and all you find is sort of, I guess, better qualities of unleaded petrol, but we don't use lead in petrol anymore, and we also don't use it in paint. Lead oxide was a very important pigment that was used, particularly in those yellow lines you often see if you're travelling in, um, in the country, and 
again, not anymore. It's one of those that's been replaced. But such a large amount of lead still remains in the environment and therefore it's very important for us to be able to monitor those lead levels and to be able to give people fair warning ahead of time if we think there's going to be a problem with them. Where are we going to monitor? Well, we monitor everywhere, really. Um, so we monitor the atmosphere, and we'll look at the atmosphere in a little bit more detail in the next um, set of videos. We look at we monitor waterways, and that's the last section of this topic. A little bit of a specific look at, at waterways, but we also drink water, and we want to make sure that the water that comes into our homes for drinking is as pure as it can possibly be, and certainly free of any contaminants like heavy metals. Because of the use of lead paints on roadways, um, any of the surface soils, especially those ones near highways, may have high quantities of lead still remaining or higher than normal quantities of lead still remaining in the soils. And so we need to make sure that we check them regularly, monitor them and manage what's happening with those lead levels and, and keep people aware. Any landfill that contains lead products, and of course we still use lead batteries, um, our car batteries use lead um, as an electrode, both the cathode and the anode, and as they contain lead, that's another little problem. When we dispose of those batteries, what do we do with that lead? Even certain types of foods, where they've been grown, the soils that they've been grown in, any um, fertilizers that may have been um, added to the soils, also need to be monitored to make sure that there are no problems with those. And certain types of fish, which may have picked up, uh, for example, traces of mercury, we need to monitor those levels as well and make sure that uh, we don't have a problem with them. So a question from 2005, um, obviously part of the bigger question, so I've just pulled this little section out here where we have to, um, uh, we're told about the concentration of ions and substances used by society need to be monitored, so that's, that sort of targets you into this area. And then what you need to do is to justify, which is giving reasons for um, this statement in reference to one ion that you have studied. Now, this is um, such an open question, you can pick anything you like. You could talk about hydrogen ions and the fact that they can affect the pH of water, and therefore this can in turn affect the uh, activity of organisms. Activity. Uh, it can also affect the ability of certain substances to dissolve and and uh, quite a range of other things. Uh, probably one of the other ones to pick is lead, and I've talked in this video a little bit about lead and the, the problems associated with um, both the uses of lead and the fact that it remains in the environment and the fact that it has such a negative effect on health, negative health effect. So to justify, we need to give reasons in reference to one ion that we've studied. So if we said we want to study lead, we want to keep an eye on the concentrations because it may well be that lead could get into our soils or into our water. We know that it's going to have a detrimental effect on human health and therefore we need to monitor the levels to make sure that they are safe. And we need to intervene if we find that these levels are too high. Thanks for watching.